Well, hello, good evening to you. Welcome. This is Ghana Tonight. We're live on YouTube sub here at Desawe Kanda. Also live on TV Ghana on Facebook. Yes, channel 279. We're all across the world on TV Ghana as well. Now, tonight, we are touching base with our men on the ground in the Volta region, where the Akonsombo Dam village has wreaked havoc in some communities. We'll tell you how many displaced residents are trying to put their lives together. Very, very unfortunate situation there. Stay with us. We're in Mepe. We are in Sogakofe and also parts of the eastern region as well. Also, Chief Executive Officer of the Fang Capital Bank at and jailed for stealing and money laundering in a case that has dragged for years with many twists and turns. Does this bring finality and justice to all in this case? We'll find out. Stay with us here on Ghana Tonight. Also, TV3 and partners commended by stakeholders for its national dialogue on making a case for an effective asset declaration law, which was held earlier today. We have highlights for you, including a conversation on the back of this all-important national dialogue. Clear that a lot more needs to be done if we, we have to be committed to the fight against corruption, especially in the public sector. There was a conclusion that the current asset declaration law is not fit for purpose there's a lack of political will to get this fixed stay with us as always we are very very interactive the hashtag we're using is gonna tonight on facebook and twitter join us let's get talking let's settle for gonna briefs Deputy Attorney General Alfred Chiayebua has expressed satisfaction at the court's decision to jail former CEO of Capital Bank, William atu -Essien. He tells TV3 in an exclusive interview that parts of the funds have been recovered and the convict could appeal against his sentence if he pays the rest of the money. My expectation is that when he pays, then perhaps it will go into mitigate when he wants to appeal against the sentence. But I'm here to get a full ruling, to go through it and see what the judge said. But so far as we are concerned, he's been sentenced into 15 years imprisonment. Let's hope that he gets the money to pay. The Chief Justice has begun a probe to determine whether a new High Court judge should be taxed to handle the Cecilia Dapa case. The Office of the Special Prosecutor has filed a petition claiming that current judge Edward Chum is biased. <music> Speakers at the Media General National Dialogue on Assets Declaration in the country are advocating for a more stringent sanctions regime for public officers involved in assets declaration processes. They contend that public officers do not attach seriousness to the process because there is no clear punishment for not complying with the requirement. Since the 1992 Constitution came into being, Chapter 24 only gave a skeletal uh, outline of what requires to be done. If you look at what should be in an asset declaration law, what is provided there is as if we are taking public service as uh, the process by which we want to hide public servants from the people who they are supposed to serve. The floods in parts of the Volta region following excess water spillage from the Akonsomo and Kwon dams have reached catastrophic levels. Many more communities in the region are bearing the brunt with schools closed down roads ripped apart and power supply cut off. At phase two right now, and it's a cycle. Uh, it's normal at this time of the year for us to experience inflows. The difference is that we are getting more than expected. And to safeguard this dam, it means that we have to spill water. That is the standard operation for any hydro dam. 
But the inflows that we are experiencing now, of course, are in excess, and therefore you see what we are spilling you know, down there. Definitely, as the cycle goes through, this will recede. The meeting between aggrieved customers of Gold Coast Fund Management and officials of the Finance Ministry has hit a dead end. This is the meeting that prompted the suspension of a continuous 48-hour process at the Ministry. They are pushing for the release of some 5.5 million CDs approved as a bailout fund for them. We are privy that money is meant for our payments. The Finance Ministry claims it has been spent whilst we have not received those payments. In fact, they were not forthcoming with information on that request, that whether these monies have been spent by Finance Ministry or not. But they promised that in our subsequent meeting, which is going to be held next two weeks. Music icon and host of the 2023 AFCON draw, Akon believes that the event gives the continent a chance to market themselves to the rest of the world. He believes Africa has a huge potential in sports and other fields. <laughs> The, the, the argument that people will get to know how much assets you have and how much uh, you have in your, your, your bank account. If you would want to play the game, then you must simply obey the rules of the game. If you don't want people to see your ties, you don't play football because you don't wear trousers to, to play football. They will give you a jersey. You can't wear a smock and say you are going to play football or going to swim. So if you want to play the game, then you must obey the rules of the game. When I was in office, I had a lot of uh, MP friends and other public servants who raised this argument. And, and I was asking them, look, even the Auditor General also declares his or her assets to the President, the same way as you do yours. So if you publish, mine will also be published. How come that you are so afraid of publishing? You have too much. I don't have too much, so I'm ready to publish. The point is that almost all these public servants are guilty of abusing their offices in acquiring and uh, a worth of assets or assets which they cannot justify. Hence, this shoddy argument that if we publish it, armed robbers will come after us. Don't the armed robbers know the type of houses they have, the type of vehicles they have? Have they come after them? Well, that was Daniel Yao Demelevo, the former Auditor General of the Republic of Ghana. He was also a panel member on this all-important conversation that we had earlier today, the TV3 National Dialogue on the fight against corruption in the public sector, making a case for a more stronger, effective asset declaration regime. And that's quite clear. There. There's going to be a lot more of it tonight as we go on, for just those of you who missed on to, to catch up as well. But coming up next here on Ghana Tonight, the Chief Executive Officer of the Defund Capital Bank, William Atuasian, jailed for stealing and money laundering in a case that has dragged for years with many twists and turns. Does it really bring finality and justice to, to all on this matter? And th this 15-year jail term, we will let you understand how come, um, even though if you put it all together, it was 95 years based on the specific um, issues and the counts and also all the crimes that were brought against him, the money laundering and stealing. All of it put together, 95 years, but he's going to be serving concurrently, so it's come up to 15 years. Now, let me take you through a timeline as to how long this case has traveled to this point so you understand the twists and turns and some of the statements that were made along the way, which brings up other areas and angles of conversation about this particular case and, and other financial institutions that were closed down, which the owners um, have also come out to question the basis for which that was done. But take a look at this. This is how it all started, right from the beginning to this point. August 2017, the Bank of Ghana revoked the license of Capital Bank and on the same day as UT Bank, and it declared it insolvent. That was that, that period. Fast forward October 2019, 
William Atuesian and three others were charged with the multiple counts of stealing and money laundering of various sums in excess of 250 million CDs. December 2022, William Atuesian entered into an agreement to refund 90 million CDs or is going to be sentenced. Now, all other accused persons were found were earlier cited in this case were found not guilty of their charges, including the likes of Fitzgerald Odonko and, and others were found not guilty. And so they were let go. April 2023, the Attorney General applied for custodial sentence saying that the payment terms have been breached. Remember, there was some sort of an agreement to have him pay this said amount, but the payment structure that was even agreed upon was breached. So the AG raised that concern. And then, fast forward, in October 2023, today, he has been sentenced to 15 years for failing to pay the said 90 million CDs uh, within the period. In fact, as we got to know today, the court indicated he had paid just 37 million out of the 90 million cities. The 37 million out of the 90 million cities. So of the remaining 53 million cities. Now, one of the things we're going to be finding out is if he comes up with the remaining 53 million cities, what happens? Can he appeal this ruling uh, and for him to, to go, go free or discontinue this jail term of 15 years that has been slapped on him? would we'll get some answers to that. But you recall that while all of this was going on, William Atwesian granted an interview to Good Evening Ghana, indicating that sometime in 2016, the, the finance minister now, as Ken Oforiata, approached him together with some of his associates to, to buy the bank. That's the defunct capital bank. Take a look. Was the bank stressful? Was it, was it, was it distressed? You know, you see, uh, like I said to you, mm -hmm. if the bank was that bad, our current finance minister, Honorable Ken Oforiata, to care that with the chief executive of Enterprise Group, were in my office. Kelly Gadgetpo. Kelly Gadgetpo. To, to do say, what? We're interested to buy Capital Bank. No, hold on, hold on. Ken Ophira the finance minister. Yes. And Kelly Gadzekpo, the, yes. the, his, his yes. partner at Data Bank yes. and Enterprise, yes. came to see you. Yes. This is when Ken was finance minister. No, before he became finance minister. Okay. That's right. They came to you yes. that they wanted to buy your bank. Buy the bank. If it was that stressful, would they have done so that? So this was here? This was 2016. I see. Yes. They wanted to buy. They wanted to buy Capital Bank. For Data Bank or for Enterprise? Well, um, the letter they gave to us oh, was they wrote. Enterprise Group. Yes, I have a letter to that effect. Well, he had indicated that he had a letter mm. to that effect. Eventually, the, the lawyers of Ken of Riata and Kelly Gajapo, who were mentioned in here, responded and said that their claims by Atuesian was not true. But then Atuesian had consistently indicated that this actually happened. Or that approach did take place. But fast forward to all of this, what's happening now. The Deputy Attorney General was asked this specific question about whether or not if he comes up with the remaining 53 million series to make up the 90 million he was supposed to pay, would he continue to serve that term or this deal term will be discontinued? The 15 years has been slapped on him. This is what he said to my colleague, Lord Edwasari, in this exclusive interview. Take a look. Effectively, he's, going to he's been sentenced to 15 years imprisonment. And I think this is a matter that started long ago. And last year, we decided to enter into an agreement with him for him to take advantage of Section 35, as you, as you know. We were expecting that he would go by the agreement that we had. Unfortunately, on his part, he could not fulfill his part of the bargain. And as we speak, he's been able to pay close to about 38 million Ghana cities, 37, 38 million Ghana cities. And because of inability to pay, per the agreement that we had, the court reserved the right or had the right to sentence him in, into a prison term. And today, the court did just that. Justice Eric Chaba for knows that 
um, while he's in prison. When he's able to pay the remainder of the money, he'll be able, he'll be able to work out as a free man. Is, is that the case? Uh, I'm here to get a full complement of the orders of the courts. Now that he's been imprisoned, if he gets the money to pay, that's another ball game. We'll look at it. Because after the court has given the real is ruling or judgment, the court becomes factus official. And so my expectation is that when he pays, then perhaps it will go into mitigate when he wants to appeal against the sentence. But I'm here to get a full ruling. We'll go through it and see what the judge said. But so far as we are concerned, he's been sentenced into 15 years imprisonment. Let's hope that he gets the money to pay. And let me also, also add, even if he's going to serve the 15 years, Ghanaians have also benefited somehow because at least 37 million has been paid to the state. If he had been sentenced last year, he couldn't have even recovered a CD or a PESWA. So there's no utility in the decision that we took last year concerning our decision to enter into, into an agreement with him to take advantage of Section 35. If nothing at all, the state is now richer by 37 plus million Ghana cities. Now, the goal is to recover the monies, but Capital Bank is one of several banks that collapsed and I mean, what happens to the other banks that are pending? We need to recover those monies as well to the um, customers. Yeah, as you speak, we have other cases in court. Beige Capital is in court. We are hearing the matter. And then I know, I don't know when we'll be able to finish, but we've gone far. UT is also in court. Then you have uh, other banks, Dr. Dufour's Bank, and they're also in court. So there's a series of cases in court. We are doing them one after the other. And let's get there. Is that the case that of course, the end goal is to recover the monies, but is the end game also to, I mean, at some point, get to the plea bargain where they will, they'll be able to, the state will be able to make the agreement that you had with association for them to get the monies back? Yes, if the money that we've lost, they are ready to refund the money. We look at Section 35, if they go by that, they can have the same arrangement. So our preoccupation is to ensure that, one, just is done, and this one can be done either we get the money, or if we're unable to get the money, we will go into the full hall and then get the case judgment delivered if they are convicted. So be it. So if any of the other people who are facing trial are of the opinion that they may want to take advantage of 35, nobody will stop them because it's not limited to our saying it's limited to all other people who may want to take advantage of that session. So we are waiting, but we are still prosecuting our case in court. So that's Deputy Attorney General of Echoyabua there in that exclusive interview with my colleague, Lord Edward Sari, indicating if he pays, what happens next. But this has been a long winding case. And Professor John Gachi is the Dean of the University of Cape Coast Business School. He's joining us for a quick conversation on this. Professor Gachi, thank you, as always, for joining us here on Ghana tonight. Seeing how this, after this long period of the back and forth in court, 15 years on, on uh, William Atuisian, and then also uh, the, attorney, the Deputy Attorney General's point he makes about if he does find the money to pay, then what happens next? Will you say justice has been served? Well, so long as they adduce facts to uh, the process of prosecution, uh, one will not say that justice is not served. But in the scheme of things regarding the bank, uh, the officers of a bank hold uh, all fiduciary duties to the bank. In fact, they must act in utmost good faith towards the bank. The bank is a separate legal entity, and and that is distinct from the officers. So we, when the officers offend the bank, we expect the regulator to come in to get the people who offended the bank punished. Uh, but that is separate from uh, the collapse of the bank because the regulator is under special duty to ensure that the bank leaves while those who offended the bank by acting criminally towards the bank are punished. So I, I think that uh, this justice that we're talking about should be directed towards the bank, but the bank is no more to experience I, I, the justice that have been If I get the understanding... The officer in question. Uh, so you support the prosecution of persons who were identified to have engaged in one wrongdoing or the other, but it should not be a justification for the closure of these banks and other financial institutions. Exactly so. 
And that is what uh, I, for instance, keep saying from day one, that when people uh, uh, actually did criminal uh, act against the bank, you are supposed to arrest those people and prosecute them. But the bank has not done anything against the republic. Therefore, the republic should not be seen to uh, to act in a manner to collapse the bank. The bank has, a, a, I mean, a right to live perpetually. And that is one of the special duties of the regulator to ensure that the bank is protected from collapse. The bank is protected in such a way that it lives in perpetuity. But I, I believe some people would think that this is the justification for the collapse of the banks, but it is not. Uh, we are dealing with uh, a matter that is um, rooted in the principles of good governance, the principles of law. And uh, the bank is actually a separate entity from the, the individual who has committed crime against the bank. So we expect the regulator to be on the side of the bank to punish those who offended the bank. Because remember, the bank uh, is not a human being, though he has a legal right, but it's not a, uh, it's not a human being, so he cannot fight for this. Uh, that is why the regulator is there to fight for the bank. So if you collapse the bank because somebody has offended the bank, then that is... That, that is uh, uh, very difficult to comprehend. And, uh, but per the records as well, Professor Gachi, we have a few more of these um, persons who either owned some of the defunct banks or worked as the leadership of these defunct banks standing trial. UT Bank, um, there, is, there is the Beige Capital, that's Mike Minako and, and the others. And then also you have the likes of Unibank as well. Um, still in court on one, some of the issues that came up. That's how the coming days are going to be looking like. If uh, they have uh, arranged people who have offended the various banks, uh, it is uh, right for them to be prosecuted. But the point I'm making is that their prosecution should not be justification for the collapse of such banks. Because what wrong has the, the bank committed? The bank is established and has appointed uh, people to act on its behalf. Uh, it's rooted in law that these people are to, or were to act uh, uh, in utmost good faith, uh, were to act in a manner that is so transparent to the bank. And if they didn't do it, and, and the regulator discovered that, those people who ought to be punished. And the regulator at that moment has a duty to protect the bank from being collapsed. Right. But if, if you listen to the, the, the likes of the finance minister and by extension persons associated with government, the justification that they give for the closure of these financial institutions plus the prosecution of the persons who led to the decision by the regulator to redraw their licenses was that they wanted to protect depositors' funds. Is there any real justification based on at least what we have seen still happening in the financial sector now? ...to anybody that anybody was losing money. People were going to the bank and taking their money normally. It was until the bank was collapsed. Even though the bank might have had uh, some difficulties apparent on it books but it is, was not the case that people were going to the bank and they were not getting their money so the point i'm making is that the bank did not collapse until a decision was taken to collapse it and i am saying that all companies including banks have a separate legal entity from their offices and the officers are under fiduciary duty and uh, uh, expected to act transparently towards the company and are also en to ensure that they act to protect the company. When they uh, renege on that duty, the regulator comes in to protect the, the bank. And in attempt to protect the bank, 
is not an uh, opportunity to kill the bank because the bank did not offend anybody. It is rather individuals who offended the bank and the bank must seem to receive the protective, uh, you know, uh, 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 regulatory uh, support. Mm. Professor Gatti, appreciate your time on this. Thank you very much uh, for joining us. Professor John Gatti is the, the Dean of the University of Cape Coast Business School. And this is Ghana tonight. Remember, we're live on TV3 Ghana on Facebook. Also, DSV Channel 279, all across the world on 3 newscom Coming up next, we're touching base with our men on the ground in the Volta region where the Akonsombo Dam spillage has wreaked havoc uh, in some communities. We'll tell you exactly what's happening. A really, really sad situation there. And over the last 48 hours, these persons living in these communities have had to grapple with the impact of the spillage as we speak. Now, we've, we've been receiving videos from some of you um, in, the, in these communities there. Let's go to the Mepe community first off. And these are the combined videos of what we got earlier today. That's the aerial view. Take a look at that. These are houses submerged in the excess water spilled from the Akonsombo Dam. That's how bad the situation is. In fact, some houses have been submerged even to the roof level. That's the aerial view of the level of flooding we're talking about. And over 2,000 households have been displaced in Mepir alone. That's the whole community on the screen there. Sugakofe as well, as we speak, parts of it submerged under the flood waters, the excess water spilled from the Akonso Bodam. And it's quite worrying to say the least. And, and we have reports that there is a, a mortuary also in, in one of the communities as well where over 250 bodies are there. Even though the flood waters haven't really gotten into that area, yes, it's just a matter of time. And we, that's the aerial view of the extent of flooding. It stretches way beyond the shores of the Volta Lake. And that's how worrying the development is. Even though we're getting reports that the, the Navy, the Ghana Navy is on ground there. And some residents are also taking advantage of this and charging people for the usage of the canoe. The canoe you're seeing there, people have to pay to also to be transported from one end to the other. So even in the disaster situation, some people are just making money off the misfortune of people. That's what you see there. Now, with no other choice, the residents are having to flee to higher grounds in search of refuge and safety. This is the video we got from the Mefe area. And uh, houses and businesses in Bakwa, Bakwa, Kome, and Mepe have also been inundated with water levels reaching critical heights. Now, residents have been forced to evacuate their homes, leaving behind you know, cherished possessions and, and livelihoods. For what we're learning is that children are unable to attend school, and local businesses have also come to a standstill, leaving many without a source of income. And some of them have had to carry their words. Television sets that have been destroyed and, and, and other property. Now the community leaders, alongside the affected residents, are passionately calling on government to step in and provide immediate aid to those suffering from the flood crisis. And the need for essential supplies, safe shelter, medical assistance is paramount as the flood has not only displaced people, but has also raised concerns about the waterborne diseases and other health risks in the area. That's how worrying the situation is as we speak um, in these communities that have been affected, stretching all the way to some parts of the eastern region as well. We understand areas like uh, the Esujaman areas as well, and parts of Adan, in the eastern part of the Greater Accra region have been affected by these floods as a result of the spillage of the excess water from the Akonsombo Dam. 
And we're monitoring this quite closely and uh, giving you updates on, on how things are playing out there. Really, really worrying and, and sad situation there. Saji Saji is Deputy Director General of the National Disaster Management Organization, NADMO. He's joining us on the telephone for a quick conversation on what's happening there. He is, from, from what we're getting, he's in the community leading the relief process for these persons who have been displaced, running into thousands. In the Mepere alone, we understand over 2,000 people have been displaced, unfortunately. Uh, Mr. Saji Saji, thank you so much for joining us here. But have you been able to get into the Sogakofe and the Mepe communities as yet? And, and what have you done for these persons who have been displaced? Yes, uh, we have done all the, that all the uh, South Town, Central Town, and, and North Town. Um, as we speak uh, from your report, uh, North Town is uh, where the whole place especially the Mepe community, that water has taken over almost the whole community. Even the other side of the road, the water has found its way to the other side of the road. To the extent that where we are moving the people to, which is the St. Vito Catholic Secondary School, the road to the place, we cannot access that road uh, to even send food items to the people. So we just managed to mobilize uh, a boot so that we can go where the school is, is a bit elevated. So, I mean, the water will not get there. But the route to the place is also a difficult challenge now for us. But uh, the, we understand that the, the VRA has also indicated that the spillage of this excess water from the Akonso Bodam will continue to safeguard the integrity of the Akonso Bodam. But how about... You, I mean, not more. Have you put any measures to safeguard the lives and property of the, of the people in these communities? That that we don't know, but uh, the VRA is giving us indication that uh, they are hoping that uh, in the course of about a week, you know, they started on Tuesday, so we are hoping that in about a week, uh, the rate of spillage will be reduced. And then we can start getting some uh, re re respite for the water to be receiving. The concern of the residents uh, whom we have been speaking to, from Sogakofe to Mepe to Keta, part of Keta as well, have been affected to Adai and uh, all of these places, is that they were not given enough time. The notice before this spillage was, was not really enough for them to, to prepare adequately before this village started, correct? Yes, so can say to a large extent they are right about the kind of level of village now. You know, the village started two weeks ago, and I'm not sure you even heard it. Two weeks ago, VRA had alerted all the communities of their controlled village, and that village was going on. But because of the inflows from the attachment areas up north, they have to secure the integrity of the dam, as you have said. So they suddenly increased the, the rate of spilling. But they had informed us a day before, and we had informed um, a lot of communities. But because the spilling was ongoing, even uh, the staff of the VRA themselves, they are also surprised. I see. But this was supposed to be a controlled spillage from the earlier communication from the VRA. But with, with the levels of water we are seeing gushing out of the, the spill gates of the Akonsombo Dam, can this still be described as controlled spillage? So, yes, now it is not. Now it is, based, you know, they have emergency phase one, which is normally the controlled spillage. When it gets to emergency phase two, it is no more. And now it is emergency phase three. I see. So what this means is that the excess water is going to be flowing out uncontrollably and the, these residents, unfortunately, would have to bear the brunt of this. Exactly. To save the integrity of the dam because if the, um, um, if in the unlikely event that we have a dam break, 
we will not be even talking this way. It will be something unimaginable. So in order not to have that kind of situation, this is what we are having, which is also terrible and affecting us seriously like this. Well, thank you very much for joining us, Saji Saji, uh, Deputy Director of the National Disaster Management Organization, leading the relief efforts in these areas affected by the spillage of excess water from the Akonsombo Dam. Now, when we checked from the VRA website just about some few minutes ago, this is the water levels as they published on their website in the Akonsombo Dam, way in excess of what has to be there. Thursday, October 12th. 276.92 feet. That's 84.4 meters. Remember, yesterday it was 271. So as we speak, even though they are spilling excess water, the water levels in the dam is rising from 271 to 276 as of today. And they continue to spill. So you can understand the, 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 the extent of the situation, even though they are spilling this excess water to safeguard the integrity of the Akonsombo Dam. Previously, we were dealing with the excess water spill from the Bakri Dam in Burkina Faso. Now it's our own dam, and, and that's what we're dealing with now. And the rising levels of the water in the Akonsombo Dam is worrying. And that's what the VRA is, is also looking at as well, even though their spilling water is rising. But this is Ghana tonight. It's something that we're keeping an eye on as well. Our men in the area will be joining us as we go. But coming up next, right after this quick break, we bring you excerpts of the all-important conversation, uh, the renewed efforts that we're making in the commitment to uh, fight corruption in the public sector. Earlier today, we had a dialogue, a TV3 national dialogue, on the fight against corruption. The Deputy Attorney General, Joseph Wittal, the Commissioner for the Commission of Military Justice, Martin Pebble, we're all here. Stay with me. We'll be back shortly after this quick break. We'll hear some more. gentlemen we're going to demonstrate to you the superior properties of flamingo paint as compared to other paint brands on the market we take equal quantities of flamingo paint and this ordinary paint we then dilute them with water and now let the test begin the gentleman on the left is going to apply the ordinary paint and the gentleman on my right will use the flamingo superior paint as you can clearly see Flamingo has the obvious better hiding. Furthermore, Flamingo has painted a much larger area. You know, one bucket of Flamingo paint is equal to several buckets of any other paint brand on the market. Flamingo paint is made with superior formulation to give superior durability, superior hiding, superior coverage. Flamingo paint, simply superior. I want you so bad, Alpha Cracker. I want you. I wanna say yes, I can't resist. I want you. Ooh, I want wow. you, Alpha Cracker. I want you so bad. <laughs> Have a goodness rich in milk and butter in Alpha Cracker. Yummy and deliciously crunchy. Alpha Crackers. 
simply irresistible. This advert is FDA approved. Everybody knows Acrobato. And if you know Acrobato, it means you know M Punch Homeopathy Clinic. M Punch Homeopathy Clinic is my pillar. Let's hear what others are saying about M Punch Homeopathy Clinic. Who will be careful M Punch Wana? Ha! And everything me do so say my name ko ye and pass one my name nyi na and me gina sabe ma na me no be fie e ho na nyi na ji arisa you got everything i have secret m point is my secret m point from your particular every whatever you from co trading enterprise is your leading mobile phone accessories and your electronic retail outlets you can buy any item online at the comfort of your home from franco trading enterprise just download the Franco Trading app on Google Play Store or App Store or visit our website at www.francotrading.com. You can buy all brands of mobile phones, television, air conditioning, home theaters, and any other accessories. For online purchasing and more inquiries, just call us on 0501-502-670. Franco Trading Enterprise, we are still the home of quality mobile phones. In this is Key Points, the number one award winning television news analysis program providing an enlightened analysis of the key issues facing us as a country. The Key Points of the stories that matter with the people who matter. This is Key Points, the number one award winning television news analysis program. Every Saturday, 7 a.m. to 10 a.m. on TV3 and on Free FM 92.7. TV3, first in news. Welcome back. This is Ghana Tonight. And before we go into a conversation on the asset declaration, there's some news coming through and we just get it out of the way. Coming up next, Ghana will renew their football rivalry with Egypt as the two powerhouse teams are set to face off in the upcoming Africa Cup of Nations tournament in Ivory Coast. Let's stay a bit further on this and um, uh, uh, let's cross over to the venue where the announcement was made and uh, we get to know the teams that we've been also now selected to be in that group C and D and E with and Oriku Ampofo is where the three sports team um, is going to be connecting with us in a bit. But these are the various groups and the countries in there, as was earlier announced. Take a look. First off, Group A, Ivory Coast, Nigeria, Equatorial Guinea, Guinea-Bissau. Group B, Egypt, Ghana, Capo Verde, Mozambique, and Group C, Senegal, Cameroon, Guinea, the Gambia. And then Group D, Algeria, Burkina Faso, Mauritania, Angola. Group E, Tunisia, Mali, South Africa, Namibia. And Group F, Morocco, DR Congo, Zambia, Tanzania. These are the six groups, and this is Ghana's group. Egypt, Ghana, Cape Verde, Mozambique. You'll see there. This was earlier announced. And there have been already some, some reactions. Um, 
Mission's draw is currently underway at the Parc des Positions here in Abidjan, Cote d'Ivoire. And we do know that the Black Stars are in pot two and could uh, potentially get a difficult group, especially when you're looking at the teams in pot one, where they could face host Ivory Coast. They could face Morocco, who reached the semi-finals of the FIFA World Cup. They could also face Algeria, uh, who have been strong. Tunisia are also in there. Remember, they knocked the Black Stars out of the AFCON in 2019. And then there's also Senegal, uh, who are also Afghan champions uh, themselves, uh, winning the 2020. That, that's that's what's happening now. Let's cross over uh, now to the venue of the announcement. And my colleague Oreko Ampofo uh, is joining us live. Oreko. Now we know the teams we're playing uh, in, in Group B. How you you were there with some Ghanaians as well? How's the reaction been? Uh, Alfred, I don't know if you can hear me. I can, can hear you hear clearly. Me? Okay, uh, so we just finished the draw. Um, you know the media work, the mix zone, and all that. So I'm just walking, trying to find the car. But with regards to uh, the question that you asked. Um, I think it, 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 it was a good draw for Ghana. It could have been much worse uh, looking at the seedings that we did, you know, find ourselves in. Uh, I think the reaction was that of relief with the first two because uh, as you could tell from uh, the procedure, they did begin from port four where they picked Mozambique and then Cape Verde and then Ghana. So when Ghana was picked, there was a loud cheer because obviously... Cape Verde and Mozambique are two beatable teams for Ghana. When it got to the pot one, the room was dead silent because everyone knows of the quality of these top sides and it's, it's inevitable. You cannot avoid them, but some are stronger than others. And so when Egypt was mentioned right up there for Ghana in Group B, uh, you could hear some A's in the crowd and some surprises and shocks because... Ghana's record against Egypt since beating them 6-1 at the Babayara Sports Stadium in 2013 hasn't been that great. We've played them four times since then. Uh, we've lost on two occasions and only picked up one draw. And so it looks like that would be the most difficult test for Chris Hutton. But the other two teams, uh, it should be manageable for, for the Black Stars. I see. Now, Rick, I'm going to let you go. Uh, but how about you spoke to Akon as well, and he's the ambassador for this for this uh, Afghan in Ivory Coast, how, how's, how's the feeling like? I didn't quite get a question. What was the last question? As, as you, you, what, spoke what to, you, you, you spoke to Akon as well, correct? Uh, at, at the same venue of, of this announcement. Now, what should we be looking forward to uh, with his participation and his ambassadorial role in, in this particular tournament? I think when the announcement was made that Akon would be uh, part of this, you know, Afghan draw, uh, there were a number of eyebrows being raised uh, because, yes, he is, um, well, he's mostly been predominantly known for his music. And that's what people thought his involvement would be as a guest performer. Uh, but it was a bit more than that this time. He was actually a host and he actually was involved in the whole process from the beginning to the end. And I think it, it did quite come as a surprise the knowledge that he has in the game, probably is from the amount of preparations that has gone into him hosting the tournament. But you could tell from some of the references that he made uh, with some of the players and how they performed in previous tournaments that uh, football is his passion. And Akon has always been widely known as a Pan-African person who loves to uh, push the African agenda. And so maybe this is one way uh, that he can continue, you know, contributing to the growth of Africa, even beyond music. Well, thank you very much, Oreko, and keep safe uh, there in Ivory Coast. Oreko and Puffo joining us live from the streets of Ivory Coast after this event, uh, the announcement of uh, the uh, various teams and their groups in the Africa Cup of Nations 2024 and coming up in a couple of months. Well, coming up next here on Ghana Tonight, uh, TV3 and partners have been commended by stakeholders for its national dialogue on making a case for an effective asset declaration law, which was held earlier today. Now, let's take a few highlights, right?
uh, exactly what was said by some of the uh, persons who, who came through earlier today. Let's start off with Daniel Yao Demelovo, the former Auditor General of the Republic of Ghana, who made the point that the lack of leadership and also the commitment, the political will to fight corruption in the public sector is what had led to the inefficiencies in the asset declaration regime. Take a look. Law assumes that the Auditor General is a mini god or a demigod. Hence, he will know or be able to know what other assets you have which you have not declared. And I don't think that is practical. So for it to be effective, it must be known to the public so that the public, like the Deputy uh, Attorney General rightly said, is a collective effort. So the people can look into the declaration and say, ah, but we have a five-bedroom house here. He has not declared it. So that we know that the declaration is not complete. But if we do all the other things and we do not include the publication, I don't think we have gone very far. And let me add to what uh, lawyer Martin Pebu said. Uh, before we go international, let's look home. We have a better practice in home where the declaration was published and to be verified. And I think we may have to go back for that. One big regret I have for Article 286 and uh, at 550 is the fact that the act is entrenched or the article is entrenched. So modifying it is very difficult. Why, why, why do I say so? I personally think that the Auditor General is not well placed to be the person to administer assets and liabilities declaration, except that people underrate the amount of work that the Auditor General has to do auditing the entire country, all the institutions, etc. The audit alone is too much for one person. And so to add asset declaration to it is to ensure that it doesn't receive the necessary attention that it, it requires. For, because when you say you are Auditor General, you must concern yourself first with the main work of the Auditor General, which is auditing. So to be able to administer asset declaration and liabilities declaration effectively, I thought that should not have been, first and foremost, even the mandate or the responsibility of the Auditor General. But it is the responsibility and unfortunately, like I said earlier on, entrenched. So it is going to be a very uh, tall order or very expensive venture. But if, in, if we want to keep it under the Auditor General as it is currently, at least we must ensure that the declaration at least is verified. And I'm happy that, that the 2022 bill that I've seen uh, has a, a provision for the declaration. We must ensure that people declare before they take their offices. And that is also being provided for under the 2022, uh, which I've seen, which is good. Daniel Yardemelovo, former Auditor General, Joseph Vital, the Commissioner for the Commission on Human Rights, Administrative Justice, that's Shraj, was also a member of the panel for this all important conversation. This is what he had to say. What requires to be done? The nearest we came to is to pass the Act 550, which is the uh, Public Officers Qualification and Disqualification Assets Declaration Act. And that, I think, was a shoddy job done by Parliament. I must say, with all respect to Parliament. It's a shoddy job. Yeah, at that time. If you look at what should be in an asset declaration law, what is provided there is as if we are taking public service as uh, a process by which we want to hide public servants from the people who they are supposed to serve. Why do I say that? Under the Rawlings regime, I played a bit of a role shortly before constitutional rule. I had to declare my assets. So it means that there was an, a pre-existing PNDC law which required public, act, uh, public de uh, declaration of assets. But when we came to the constitutional period, we now we did away with the requirement for declaration publicly of the assets of public officers.
Well, the Deputy Attorney General of the Chair also expressed concerns about the inability of the Auditor General to verify what public officers also declare in the assets. Take a look. For publication of assets, now, as the Commissioner said, if you have assets A, B, C, and D, liability A, B, C, and D, it, it should not be difficult for you to declare it. If actually you are very sure that declaration is something that you, all those assets are assets that you properly acquired. Now, the question about whether you are to publish it in the dailies or for everybody to see, the current law does not make such a provision. Is that about you writing it as I did mine, then go to the Auditor General in a brown envelope, you dump it there, you take your receipt, you come back home, and you sleep. So if, for example, I have to use myself, mm -hmm. I want to acquire access more while I'm in this particular office. The simple thing for me to do was just to say, I own a house in Sudan, that's, that's my home base. Right. Three bedroom house. Mm -hmm. But in my declaration, I may say I have 10 bedroom house in Sunyane. If you go to Sunyane, you see a house there. Yes. So it means, oh, DAG has a house in Sunyane. Mm -hmm. But since you've not verified, it's possible that within the four years that I'll be in office, I'll go remodel that house to, to a modern edifice. And make it 10 bedrooms. And that is it. And so that's the house. So these are some of the shortfalls in the current law. Then oh, that's uh, the Deputy Attorney General of Ethiopia, who was also uh, with us earlier today on the T3 National Dialogue on the fight against corruption. It's going to be bits and pieces in a subsequent engagements here on Ghana tonight. But Professor Enoch Enchi is a governance and leadership expert. He's joining us on Zoom. Thank you, Prof, for joining us here on Ghana tonight. Clearly, the lack of political will is one of the major issues that has stalled this fight against corruption on many fronts in this country, is it not? Yes, Alfred, I agree with you perfectly, 100%. Uh, the political world is not there, and there are many factors attributing to it, either from the political parties themselves or from the leadership, uh, because the political parties give back to those in government. And you can see that they don't have the will to do that because they are afraid to declare their assets. And even by law, when they declare their assets, the authorities are not able to see what is in that? So if I come and say that I have three pieces of land and a house and three cars, these we are not able to verify. So if I'm leaving office and I have those, then I'm justified. So we have to find that political will and then that kind of leadership by example to say that, yes, these are my assets. The attorney general have you know access to it. The controller have access to it. We can send people to verify those assets that indeed they are mine, they are in my name. In that way, when I'm leaving office after four years or eight years, then we can open the documents and see whether what you said you had is exactly what you have in the system. Other than that, the way we are doing it now, there's no political will, there is no even the people pushing for it. Because I thought that the people themselves who push for it. Because, you know, when we establish these laws, we are talking about a perfect union for ourselves, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and the sources of blessings of liberty to ourselves and our prosperity. And if you look at what is happening now, prosperity is skewed in favor of few people who come to politics to make money. Recently, I was talking to somebody who said that she wanted to get into politics. And I asked her why she said that, just to make money. In fact, if the general idea perception is that you go into politics to make money, then this country has a big problem. Because that shouldn't be the case. And that is why this asset declaration law is very important. Because you declare an asset, we know what you have. And when you are living and you have more than that, then the authorities are supposed to come in and check the sources of your assets. We can do that. That is the only way we can ensure accountability mm. in our political system. Very important input. I, I hope you always appreciate your time. Professor Enochenchi, thank you so much for joining us here on Ghana tonight as a leadership and governance expert. Let me just indicate that in the coming days, there will be a playback of this national dialogue. That's for those of you who missed out. So we will definitely inform you to make a day. But I want to say thank you. Thank you so much. We appreciate all of you, your participation, both from the stakeholders, 
the panel members and you, the members of the general public who made the time to join us here at the Executive Theatre TV3. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. This is not the end of the national dialogues. We will continue in the interest of the development of this country. On behalf of the groups here and management and staff of Media General, thank you so much for participating. Thank you for joining us here on Ghana tonight. I am Alfred Okonse. Have a good night. Ghana Tonight is brought to you by Flamingo Paint, superior durability, superior hiding, superior coverage, simply superior.